Hi, I'm David Scheid, and I want to welcome you back to Rico Busters. Here we are in the living room of Doreen Hendrickson. Doreen and her husband have been, for lack of a better word, uh, persecuted and or prosecuted uh, for um, uh, their, their positioning and a book that, they, that Pete Hendrickson has written called Cracking the Code. And it's, it's been uh, doing so well that the IRS is, uh, is so pissed that they are giving just all these kinds of people refunds back. For those who have been reading this book, all these are names. Each one of these lines are names of people that have been getting refunds 100% back from the IRS. And this has been going on for about 12 years. And uh, needless to say, this is information that the government has been trying to hush and has not been successful in doing so and has been going to the source to uh, try to flush them down the toilet, you might say. Um, and uh, it's not, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to keep us from uh, quiet. You know, in fact, the more injustices that we are seeing, the more our voices are going to demand to be heard uh, by special grand juries, by common law grand juries, by, uh, by judges, as we keep, continue to hammer the courts with this. And uh, so without uh, belaboring my positioning on this, I want to uh, introduce Doreen Hendrickson. Yes. And uh, Doreen's story... Uh, is at kind of an apex right now because we're uh, uh, discussing uh, in about uh, a very short time, within two weeks, yeah. that uh, she is uh, scheduled to go for a sentencing hearing for something that she's already been convicted for, which as I've been looking at this documentation and that I've been talking to Doreen and her husband, been seeing that uh, this was a track... Uh, of a railroad that uh, was laid down by the U.S. Attorney uh, the, uh, in here in Michigan, in the Detroit area, the most corrupt uh, place in the, in the world, I would say, based on the free world uh, view, um, that, uh, that uh, she's been railroaded into a conviction on, uh, believe it or not, um, uh, her decline to sign something that uh, a judge had issued saying that she needed to perjure herself. And for her just simply standing on her ground, her First Amendment right to uh, free speech, to say what she, she, what she believes, or to not say what she believes, uh, she's been prosecuted and convicted with the railroading of a, a, grand, uh, a jury, a regular jury, right? Yes, a regular jury. So, Second time around. Second time around, that's Second right. Second time, right. First time was a hung jury, but um, they couldn't let it go at that. And um, Judge Victoria Roberts in downtown Detroit allowed them to come back and try again. That's a federal judge. That's U.S. Federal U.S. District judge. Court for the Eastern District of Michigan, Southern Division. I'm well familiar with them. And it, there's a lot of corrupt judges there, and we've got all kinds of stories about them. Yeah, it appears to be. <laughs> and unfortunately, this is another one. Um, we've got some documents. Uh, I've pulled some documents off the website. Uh, uh, is it New Horizons? Lost, Lost Hor Horizons. Lost Horizons. Um, a website that uh, has all of these documents on there, and anybody welcome to, to, to exhaustively search uh, this website uh, to, to see just the mounds never-ending mounds of evidence that uh, has accumulated over the last 12 years that um, this family has been dealing with this. And uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's devastating with the way they operate and the way they, uh, uh, the deception that's used. And if, if we can, I'd like to see if maybe we could just, uh, maybe you could give a, a summary of where you're at right now and then I'd kind of like to go back and, and discuss how this whole thing got started in, you know, in your own words. Yeah, I was ordered to say something that I didn't believe and ordered to sign my name to that. And to my way of thinking, you just can't do that. That's, that's, we have a First Amendment, 
and you cannot tell me what to say and say, I swear that it's true whether I believe it or not. And in this case, I didn't believe what she was telling me. Now, I know the First Amendment says that you have the freedom of speech. <clears throat> you can say what you want. You can say what you don't have to say what you want. Um, the first, you have freedom of religion. You have the freedom to uh, of the press and and uh, freedom to assemble and the freedom for a redress of grievances. Something like that. That's what I've heard. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but the the problem that we've been running into here with the uh, our government is that uh, the redress of grievance part is the problem. In your case, you you know you're you've taken this to the court of appeals, or maybe Pete has, and um, you know um, we'll get back into to that. But the issue at hand is that that you have been told that you need to say this to the IRS to put the certain numbers in there, which they have dictated to you. They being the court, which is still a person called a judge, who is in, who's who's acting the part, and uh, in my view, uh, a person that is um, uh, usurping the part when, they're, when they aren't doing this properly. Uh, that's a personal opinion. It's not going to reflect okay. on you since I know it's that right. you have your court case going on still, but th this is where I'm at with this whole thing is when, when people are doing this kind of thing without lawful authority. Well that's, well, that's part of the thing. You know, they, they want me to put certain numbers down on the form, and this is a legal contest. They're trying to say that they have some claim to my property. There should be some type of a legal contest where they state their case, I state my case, and it's adjudicated in that fashion. I put down what I believe to be true. There's a certain statute this 6020B statute that says, if they disagree with me, the secretary shall make a return of his own. That's where he can he can sign his name to the numbers he believes to be true. He shouldn't be ordering, or they shouldn't be ordering, me to sign my name to numbers I don't think are true. They've never done that. The statute says, shall make. doesn't say, maybe they can, maybe they can't. It, they're required to. Why should I sign my name to numbers that they've dictated that I don't think are true when they won't even sign their name their name to them? Nobody in their office will sign their name. Yeah, isn't it amazing? And uh, they they put themselves at a level where they don't feel like they need to, or if they do want to, they'll just stamp it on there, or they'll put a little a little S with a you know a yeah, yeah, something. But and and I'm, I'm and that's a signature stamp, yes, right? Right. And I'm just daunted by by how they can get away with all this stuff, and yet we are being compelled um, at a different level uh, to to be doing this kind of stuff, and especially in something that is untruthful, being compelled to do that. Yeah, the I I don't believe it. I I almost liken it to you know where um, people are being have a gun to their heads, you know when you have a terrorist or something ordering somebody to say something they don't believe is true, well, it's the same sort of thing where um, I'm being told to do something or I'm going to send you to prison. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're not going to shoot me, but I'll be sent to prison. Right, and, um, and okay. that's the threat right now. It's a tough spot to be in. I can really understand that, and uh, we will be coming right back in just a moment, but uh, I just want to give us a little bit of a break as we're discussing cracking the code. Hi, I'm David Scheid, and I want to welcome you back to Rico Busters. Today, I am discussing with Doreen Hendrickson the reasons why she and her husband are going public with the insurmountable number of injustices perpetrated upon the Hendrickson family for the at least this past 12 years as the federal government has been targeting Peter Hendrickson and his wife, Doreen, for Peter having written his book, Cracking the Code, first copyrighted in 2003. Doreen Hendrickson and her husband Peter are two more of the ever-growing number of RICO busters that accepted the responsibility that all of us Americans need to take on of knowing that it is those in government that have the privilege of working for us, we the people, and not the other way around. 
There's no doubt that the government sees Peter's book as a threat, and for good reason, it's true. And because more people are reading the book and discovering the truth about the history of IRS regulations and successfully getting 100% of their money back from the IRS, the federal government has stepped in. Simply put, the book is putting a pinch on the government's racketeering scheme. Uh, cracking the code is about enforcing the law, and that's why the government finds it to be such a threat. It is a threat to the government. The reason uh, that the government is engaged in the assault on my wife, Doreen, uh, uh, over completely uh, uh, outrageous charges that she is guilty of a crime for resisting orders from a court at the government's request to lie on official government forms. Uh, it is, it, the, the reason for that is because the government is so threatened by what is in this book. Peter Hendrickson has placed the history of this case on his website, LostHorizons.com, where the details can be found. Broken down more simply into yearly events, it should suffice to say that in the middle of 2003, the first edition of Cracking the Code went on sale and Peter Hendrickson became the first in American history to show that the proof was in the pudding. That year he secured the return from the IRS of all amounts withheld from his earnings, along with his Medicare and Social Security contributions, and that's when the federal government nearly immediately began preparing their first phase of attack upon the Hendrickson family. Cracking the Code is a success. Uh, it, it is for uh, more than 11 years now, Cracking the Code has been uh, equipping Americans across the country with a means for um, regaining control over their own resources as intended by the founders and the framers. It is a means by which Americans uh, individually uh, enforce their law, enforce the people's law on their public servant, on the government, which is how the system works. As you all know, all of you are conservatives, all of you are uh, uh, politically conscious people, you know our Constitution has no enforcement mechanism built into itself. It does not have troops that it can invoke of its own accord to send out to enforce its rules, to enforce its limits on the state that was created by that constitution. Doesn't work that way. The, the, the framers of the constitution were obliged to rely on the people to see to it that the people's law is upheld, is respected, is observed. They absolutely did not set up a system whereby the Constitution created a, a, a state apparatus and then everything was left to the state officials to look after themselves, to supervise themselves, to discipline themselves, to regulate themselves, and everything was going to be good. If that were the case, the Constitution would be five pages long. It would provide for the elections of the legislature, the elections of the president, the appointment of the Supreme Court, and that would be it. There would be no list of powers. There would be no Bill of Rights. There would be no prohibitions in the, in the Constitution on what government was able to do because everything would be in the hands of our completely trusted legislature and executive and judiciary to supervise each other and supervise themselves and see to it that they never did anything they shouldn't do. But of course, as you all know, that's not the case. The Constitution is not a complex document, but it is more than five pages because the founders and the framers recognized that it doesn't work that way. You are not able to simply give these people power and rely on them to you know, be decent and be good uh, and, and maybe uh, you know, be replaced every now and again with an election if the people didn't like what, what went on. It wasn't like that at all. The Constitution is a, a document of rules and restrictions. It, it, it delegates some powers and it has a whole bunch of prohibitions saying you can't in, in the course of exercising the powers, you cannot transgress on this, on this, on this, on this, on this. These are the limits within which you can operate when you exercise the powers we are delegating to you. But again, the Constitution doesn't enforce itself. It doesn't have a mechanism internally to send out you know, marshals of its own to see to it that these prohibitions are obeyed. It is the people whose law the Constitution is. The, the people are the ones who ordained the Constitution. And in so doing, they have the responsibility to be the ones to enforce. And that's all Cracking the Code is about. Cracking the Code simply teaches a reader what the law actually says and how the mechanisms are, are designed in law, actually all entirely within the statutory structures, 
to invoke the law and to see to it that it is upheld. And that's all that happens. And happily, tens of thousands of Americans across the country have been doing that, enforcing the Constitution on the state for 11 years now with phenomenal success, recovering billions of dollars that belong to them. It's not billions of dollars that they snookered away from the government in some fashion or another. This is their property that was improperly taken from them or erroneously taken from them, which they have recovered. And astonishingly, perhaps, I don't know, I should, maybe I shouldn't say astonishingly, maybe I should throw a bone here, um, happily, uh, the federal government, uh, more than three dozen state and local governments routinely respect the invocation of the law by these educated Americans and give the money back, just as they're supposed to. All the money, by the way, Social Security, Medicare, state income taxes, local income taxes, federal income taxes, all of it. Because the fact of the matter is that tax, the income tax in our structure, it's an excise tax, it has limited application, it doesn't apply to most of the economic activity of most Americans. Something that most Americans have no idea of, unfortunately. And they don't because they've been taught to not understand it. They've been actually deliberately misinformed about the nature of the tax. But this book has been revealing that truth to people, and the government does not like it a bit. It feels enormously threatened by this reality, by this information. And so it's been working to suppress this book for all the 11 years that it's been in print. Um, initially, that suppression effort involved um, attacking me with, uh, with uh, charges of promoting an abusive tax shelter in an effort to enjoin my book uh, uh, under the guise of that proposition. Um, those initial efforts failed. Uh, there were four independent actions that were undertaken in one way or another in different courts around the country. Um, all of them ultimately were withdrawn by the DOJ when it recognized that it was going to lose on all those grounds. Uh, subsequently, uh, the uh, content of cracking the code, the, the message of cracking the code was carefully miswritten and posted as the number one item on the IRS's dirty dozen list uh, in an effort to frighten people away from it. Um, it was in inaccurate, carefully inaccurate, I mean, not, not very much, just very, very well crafted, but inaccurate representation. It didn't scare anybody away. Um, everybody that had actually read the material recognized that this was an, an effort to uh, fool them into a misunderstanding, um, that, so that didn't work either. Uh, next step, government came back uh, a year after that, in 2006, and filed a lawsuit four days before tax day charging, uh, claiming that Doreen and I uh, uh, had um, uh, improperly completed our tax returns for those two years and, and improperly, erroneously received the refunds that we had received for those two years. Um, not quite so simple as simply saying that our returns were wrong. What the government did was it said, well, okay, we're proposing that they're wrong. We're not willing to sign anything saying that they're wrong, and they didn't and never have. But we would like the court to order them to change their returns and to fill them out according to, with, with this information on them and then to sign them under penalty of perjury claiming that they believe that what we've told them to say on these returns is actually true. That was their solution to this problem. Didn't happen. Fast forward eight years, well, seven years. And Doreen, one of the two of us who were subjected to that order that the government had requested from a court, which delivered it, without even so much as a single hearing, no human being ever appeared in front of this court before that order was issued. The court just said, oh, okay, sure. Here you go. Here's your order. Seven years later, Doreen is charged with criminal contempt of court on a charge of not having lied on a tax return as ordered by that judge in that case. Um, she went to two trials, she went through two trials, defended herself. This, this is a housewife. She, she, the closest thing she's ever come to legal, to legal material Hi. is watching Judge Judy on TV, which she does actually religiously because she enjoys the drama. <laughs> but that's as close as she comes to having any legal background of any kind. Um, Nonetheless, uh, uh, she, she took this on herself in uh, October of 2013, went to trial, um, uh, took the case to a hung jury. Uh, the government was unable to convict, not able to, to, to prove its completely spurious charges. 
And this despite having a completely cooperative judge, more than cooperative. This judge, at the government's request, instructed the jury, now listen carefully, instructed the jury that it was not allowed to consider the unlawfulness or unconstitutionality of the orders that Doreen is charged with resisting to lie on federal tax forms. The judge actually instructed the jury, you are not to take consideration of the fact that the orders are unconstitutional or unlawful. She was, the jury was told it did not have to reach a unanimous verdict in order to return a guilty verdict. Here, here's how it worked. The government contrived two, uh, two uh, alleged acts of offense in this contempt. There were two different things that were ordered by the judge in the 2006 uh, hearing. Uh, the, the, the charge alleged two different acts of offense, and the jury was charged that they did not all have to agree that she had done either of the two, as long as each of them thought that she did maybe one of them. That was good enough. That's not a standard. That's not a, that's not a legitimate standard for a jury to, to convict. But in this case, they, the, the government knew it had no case, and it really, really, really wants to be able to waive a C. Darren Hendrickson, Pete's wife, guilty. They really, really, really want that. And so they did everything and anything to accomplish this. And the first trial, again, failed on jury. They came back again. Seven months later, in July of 2014, Doreen faced another trial. This time, she wasn't allowed to read her opening argument or her opening statement. She wasn't allowed to finish her closing argument. She was harassed from the bench continuously. She didn't get most of, well, most of her exhibits were not allowed to go to the jury. Um, again, the un unlawful unconstitutionality of the orders was an instruction to the jury. The non-unanimous uh, verdict was an instruction to the jury. Um, the, uh, and, and in the very end of the- Don't forget inability to comply. Inability to comply yeah, was- Because you can't, you can't sign a document under penalty of perjury if you don't believe it, right? Yeah, this is pretty straightforward. It's, a, it's, a, it's an impossibility, and yeah. there's a doctrine. It's not, it's not possible to comply with that. Yeah. Um, they were allowed to, the government was allowed to tell the jury, it, as far as the inability to comply, two different times, because they got to use their, you know, their closing argument, then I got to speak, then they got another one that got to deliver another closing argument. And in each of those, she said, they used different things, like, it's not... She wasn't unable to comply. It's not as if she was in a submarine. Yeah, that was and actually... Then, and that was in the first trial they did that, and, and I objected to that during our um, jury instruction thing. I asked the judge to instruct them that they couldn't say that because that's not what inability to comply means. So they used that, and they said uh, another one was, it's not like she was in the hospital and couldn't comply. Right. And the judge just let that go, which is not what inability to comply was. And in our, when we were arguing our jury instruction, she said it was up to me to convince the jury that inability to comply meant what I said and not what they said. And there's all kinds of issues that we need to be dealing with uh, uh, together. We need to be discussing all these issues and educating the public on how this kind of thing could be happening to them as well. And uh, with that, we will be right back. Hi, I'm David Scheid, and I want to welcome you back to Rico Busters. So the court has ordered you to sign something. Yes. And, uh, and, and, and I don't believe that it's true. Right. But I'm you, supposed to do it anyhow. And you mentioned something about 620B or 6020B. 6020B. Tell me more about that statute and what, how that implies that, uh, the, um, that they can do something. That, that statute says that the Secretary of the Treasury shall make a return of his or her own if they disagree. Well, it's two part. If mm -hmm. you didn't file at all, then he shall make a return of his own. Or if he disagrees with the numbers that I filed, he shall make a return of his own to dispute what I filed. And they never did that. And, you know, even when I brought up this uh, statute during my trial, and I, um, I showed it to Judge Roberts, Victoria mm -hmm. Roberts, and she said, 
this just says the secretary, and I don't know who this secretary is. Um, is this a quote? Anyhow. If any person fails... Oh, this is, a, this is the actual statute. If any person fails to make any return required by any internal revenue law or regulation made thereunder at the time prescribed therefore or makes willfully or otherwise a false or fraudulent return, the secretary shall make such return from his own knowledge and from, from such information as he can obtain through testimony or otherwise. That means testimony of his own people if he yes, wants, right? Yes, correct. Any return so made and subscribed by the secretary shall be prima facie et good and sufficient for all legal purposes. And that would include a lawsuit. That would include a lawsuit. So uh, that, that's interesting. And that's 6020B of what, the Internal Revenue Code? Yes. Uh, okay. Basically, you're saying that they have used this 6020, uh, they've addressed the 6020B, which is a statute that gives them the authority to, to basically um, do whatever they want if they disagree with something that, that you have put into writing on a tax return or anybody. Or didn't file one at all. Correct. They, they can take, take the information they have and complete a return of their own without requiring me to say something I don't believe is true. And the First Amendment of the Constitution protects you from having to say something you don't believe is true. That's correct. To compel, the, for any judge, to have compelled you to, to put down numbers, to s swear under penalty of perjury that you believe that this is uh, truth, whether it's religious truth or any other truth. Yes. For you to express your belief on your signature that this is the truth, a truthful statement, the First Amendment protects you. Well, yes, and, and, you know, that tax form says, true and correct to the best of my knowledge and belief. And so, you know, I was ordered to say something I don't believe is true. And they have a remedy for that if they... You if know, they, they believe can, they different. Can, they, that's right. They and it, and it says that's what they have to do. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe what I say, then you have to do it on your own, and then we'll go have a real contest as opposed to a rubber stamp. And when you say that they have to do, that, that's the significance of the word shall. Correct. When I read that, and it says here, the secretary shall make such return from his own knowledge and from such information as he can obtain through testimony or otherwise. He's giving even the statute that says we can even use otherwise. That's true. You can get somebody's statement. You can get somebody that's under your employ. Get them to make a statement. You can have them sign it, whatever you want. But they didn't do that. They're coming after you, and they are going to force you to make a statement against what you truly believe. And that's... So... So when Nancy Edmonds just rubber stamped the civil suit, and um, I had no reason to believe that that was brought in good faith either, and so there were some significant changes from the first trial to the second. Um, it, the first trial with the hung jury, we we thought, well, that went okay. We have preferred an acquittal, but it went okay. So we came in with pretty much the same evidence. Um, the same opening statement, the same closing argument, well, more or less, I mean, that gets written fine-tuned after the trial. Uh, the same questions for Andrew to ask me. He was the standby counsel. Um, but what we found um, was that I was not permitted to finish my opening statement. In the second? In the second trial. Um, I was cut off repeatedly, and finally the judge told me, to sit down, she'd heard enough, basically. I don't remember the exact words. Um, She's not the one supposed to be listening. It's the jury, right? This is true. Right. So, um, and then, uh, so then the, at that point, when the prosecution rested, uh, she had t said at the beginning that I could hold my opening statement until the defense opened. So I asked her, could I finish my opening statement now? And she said emphatically, no. So we proceeded with the defense. 
um, many of the exhibits that I tried to introduce during my defense that were admitted during the first trial, um, the DOJ objected to them and she sustained their objections so that my exhibits, a number of them, did not get admitted during the second trial. Wow. Um, during the closing argument, well, then during, let's going in order here, during the, um, my questioning, the questions that we had prepared for Andrew to ask me, um, he got nearly to the end of the Andrew were, is the, the, the court standby, appointed attorney. standby counsel. Okay. He got nearly to the end of those and um, just stopped, abruptly stopped. And I knew that there were a couple more pages to go, and those pages were significant to my defense. They were court cases explaining why I didn't, I didn't believe I was under any obligation or any legal obligation to change my testimony. Um, and that's because the First Amendment is not your guidelines. No. The First Amendment tells the government, here's your box. You have to stay inside of this box. And so you've got, you've got a couple of, of, of U.S. Supreme Court rulings that define what this box is, don't you? Yeah. This is, this is something I wanted to read to the jury that I was never able to during my testimony. This is a case that was decided one month before I was arrested in June of 2013. And this case is Agency for International Development versus Alliance for Open Society. And it says um, some of the, a basic First Amendment principle is that freedom of speech prohibits the government from telling people what they must say. And then it cites some cases, and it goes on to say... At or the, not say, I would imagine. Or imagine. not say. Yeah. At the heart of the First Amendment lies the principle that each person should decide for himself or herself the ideas and beliefs deserving of, of expression, consideration, and adherence. And then it cites some cases for that. Mm -hmm. It goes on to say the government may not compel the endorsement of ideas that it approves. And it goes they can't on. Tell, so that says right there, yeah, I'll let you yeah. finish that, but that says right there that the government, well, it says may not. It doesn't say shall. It says may not. Yes. Well, so that does that mean that no, they, they may at some point no, too? No, they cannot. Um, oh, okay. That goes on, uh, if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. That's pretty cut and dried, and my jury in the second trial never heard that. They never heard it. They never heard it. Um, it's so important that they hear, you know, what all person's rights are under the Constitution. And, uh, it, uh, let me put it this way. What the obligations of the government are under the Constitution to honor your freedom of speech. Right, and then I have um, some Sixth Circuit Appeals Court rulings as well that say even minimal, the, I'll just take excerpts. And Sixth it Circuit matter. is the, the, the uh, federal appeals court that, that oversees our district. Correct, here in Michigan. So even minimal infringement upon First Amendment values constitutes irreparable injury. The loss of First Amendment freedoms for even minimal periods of time unquestionably, unquestionably constitutes irreparable injury. Um, they go on and on. And as part of this particular ruling, they cite totally um, all of these cases in support of that ruling. Um, one reason for such stringent protection of First Amendment rights certainly is the intangible nature or the benefits flowing from the exercise of those rights and the fear that if these rights are not jealously safeguarded, persons will be deterred, even if imperceptibly, from exercising those rights in the future. Um, so when a court is trying to compel you to say something under threat of going to jail, that's exactly what that is addressing right there. It, it is irreparable harm. It is. And then, well, the, and so the, these cases never got presented during my testimony. And um, Andrew, this court-appointed counsel, 
said that when I questioned him about that, I said, what are you doing? And he said at this point, well, I don't think she would have let them in, she being Roberts. She, I don't think she would have let them in anyhow. And I said, but they were in the first trial. We, we, we asked those questions, and I answered them. And he said, well, you can put them in your closing argument. Well, turns out, no. I got to my closing arguments, and as soon as I started quoting Supreme Court cases, or trying to, mm -hmm. this DOJ attorney objected, said that I was trying to introduce evidence that had not been admitted, and I was denied the opportunity to introduce them in closing arguments. So in spite of Andrew's assurance to me that I could introduce them during my closing argument, that didn't happen either. So not only did I not get to bring in my Supreme Court cases either in my testimony or in my closing arguments, but during my cross-examination the next morning, the um, U.S. attorney tossed down three exhibits that we had not had to begin with. Apparently didn't need for discovery. I'm sure they intended to use them, but I didn't have them ahead of time. Mm. Fifty pages of documents that uh, she tossed down on the table that I wasn't at, and Andrew looked at them and she said, these prove that Doreen was, or Mrs. Hendrickson, was not honest yesterday during her testimony. These show that the um, efforts, she said, were to suppress the book were simply audits. And um, this was clearly a lie, um, a deliberate lie. She was trying to impeach me in front of the jury by misleading them into thinking that. Uh, upon Once I, later on in the day, had time to actually look at them, these exhibits that she tossed down said um, they were considering possible action under certain IRS codes relating to penalties and an injunction action, clearly what I was talking about. Um, the purposes of this IDR, the term promotion, means discussions or constitutionality of the income tax, including all activity w with respect to items advertised on the website. At that time, the only thing advertised on the website was cracking the code, mm -hmm. so they were trying to do that. Um, the, um, they're seeking records related to Peter Hendrickson um, and trying to investigate potential abuse of tax arrangements, and they are issuing a summons as part of an investigation to determine whether petitioner, which Peter, is liable for civil penalties under certain codes and whether he can be enjoined from certain violations, which had to do with him publishing his book again. Now, so, are you supposed to have known about uh, these documents or these? Uh, I'm not sure. I think the thing was um, when, when all of these had to do with Peter and while, you know, yes, we're married, I didn't have any actual interaction with what was going on. I kind of knew from Peter that they were trying to get him to stop publishing his book. And that was the extent of my knowledge. I mean, I saw what he was going through. They wanted this book to go out of print and for him to stop publishing it. And that was the gist of my testimony. I'm going to just say, I'm it's sorry, railroaded. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the, a jury was railroaded. They, they lay the tracks. They say, you can't go off the tracks now, jury. And by the way, we're going to tell you what this track is made of. Even if it's, it's not raw material, even if it's, if it's uh, manufactured by the court. And, you know, those, those uh, hearings were so outrageous that there's been a book that's been written about the injustices that took place and, and the, the amount of contempt that the court actually had for you. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. I haven't read the book yet, but it's called The Motor City Witchcraft Trials. It was written by Brian Wright, and uh, I uh, I saw a little um, uh, talk that he had given about this, just real briefly. If you could uh, kind of elaborate a little bit more about what the contents of this book are, um, I'd appreciate it. Well, Brian gives a little synopsis of cracking the code, um, and I don't uh, I don't know all of the chapters right off the top of my head, but. Um, so there's a, a background about the fascinating truth about taxation of America, uh, the, the history, 
because he's got a pretty good handle on it. And he gives the history of the CTC suppression, what ha you know, from year one right up until the feds came after me. CTC being cracking, cracking the, code. the code. Right. And then um, f his observations of what went on during the trial. Now, he wasn't allowed to be in all the days of the trial because he was a witness, and he so he couldn't sit in on everything until he had testified, although he was in the hallway talking to people as they came out and talking to people who actually were in there that were not my witnesses. And in the end, he has um, now a call to legs where he's encouraging people to be there for me during my sentencing on April 9th. Well, that's something that, that uh, really we all need to be there and we all need to give the, uh, the support that you need. And, and moreover, this, uh, you know, this case is a case that, that is significant in that it affects all of us. This case is a First Amendment right uh, case. It, I, it pro it's dealing with the IRS, you know, it's dealing with the 16th Amendment. I know that uh, from the website I saw a lot of material dealing with the 16th Amendment. Yes. Uh, that uh, uh, what, what really is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the implications, and we won't get into all the details here in this particular segment, but um, this, this, this sentencing, this conviction, the fact that it was a uh, hung jury the first time around, this is a, a significant issue that is should be of interest to everybody in America. It absolutely should. It's, it's frightening to even think of this. Um, these courts tend to use, not, you know, district court cases maybe, but certainly um, they use cases as precedents. Never before in our history in the United States has anybody been prosecuted for contempt of court for refusing to talk like a trained seal on the orders of a judge. They can say whatever they want. They can sign their name to it if they want. But you cannot compel me to say something I don't believe. This happened. And anyone who watches this who thinks... They won't use my case as a precedent to come after them? Correct. I'm, I'm frightened for my children. You know, I have a 19 and a 24-year-old. I don't want this for them. They shouldn't be afraid to talk or not talk. It's, it's not up to some black-robed person who sits on their high little bench there to tell me or anyone else in this country what they can say or what they can't say. Well, Doreen, I, I really appreciate the, this testimony that you're giving here. For, uh, we want people to be trained uh, about the law. We want them to know about what they can do in, in their own cases, uh, and uh, there are many cases out there. So we will be right back in just a moment. Uh, I think that we need to take just a little bit of a break. Thank you. Welcome back to Rico Busters. In this final segment about the conviction of Doreen Hendrickson for criminal contempt, it is important to focus on just how far the executive and judicial branches of our federal government will go to work together to fend for themselves and to act on behalf of the IRS as their major funding mechanism to repeatedly conspire against all of our constitutionally guaranteed rights rather than to put checks and balances upon one another so to guarantee our rights under even just the most basic First Amendment. We turn to Peter and Doreen Hendrickson themselves for that as they are fully aware of the government's obligation to observe and protect the guarantees of their rights under the First Amendment. And, you know, and again, the Constitution does not enforce itself, guys. This is, you know, here's one of the one of the perfect examples of the fact the Constitution does not enforce itself. It requires the people to actually feel that this is important and to and to stand up and actually act on their own. And and so this is what has happened with Doreen. Doreen is due to be sentenced on April 9th, just two and a half weeks from now, uh, down in downtown in uh, uh, Victoria Roberts courtroom. 
Um, and this is the basis for the, for the, the sentence that will be imposed, is that she was uh, duly convicted or found guilty by this jury in this case of the crime of resisting an illegal order that no judge is empowered to, to make. And in fact, that, that, that the U.S. government is prohibited from making under the First and Fifth Amendments. First Amendment says your speech rights are your own. You can't be told what to say. You can't be told what you believe, what the, that you have to say you believe something. And that's specifically what Doreen was ordered to do. She was ordered to say she believes that her earnings qualify as income within the meaning of that term in the law. When I tried to bring up the Constitution or the Supreme Court rulings, these hacks from Washington that got flown in to prosecute me um, objected that I was trying to introduce the law. Yes. And, and so we had that several I, the, times. their objections were sus sustained, and um, I was not to introduce any law. Judge Roberts will tell them what the law is. There was an amazing uh, incident of that kind um, in, in the middle of the trial uh, in which uh, Doreen was um, uh, bringing into evidence um, a statute, uh, uh, 6020B, uh, 26 U.S.C. 6020B. It's the statute that mandates that the government is to create a return of its own when it feels that a false, fraudulent, or frivolous return has been supplied or that one has not been created at all and yet is required. That's what the statute says. It is a mandatory imposition on the government. They are required to produce and sign a return of their own in order to look out for the government's interests. Okay. Perfectly, perfectly reasonable that they be obliged to do that. So Doreen was uh, going to present that law, and it, while this was while cross-examining one of the government attorneys who was a witness for the government, and say, did you ever do this? Real simple question. The law says, if you believe that a return that's been filed is false, frivolous, or fraudulent, you have to do this. And so the question was very simple, have you done this? And standing there with the actual text of the statute in her hand, Melissa Siskind, attorney for the government, said, Your Honor, this statute is only about failure to file. And Judge Roberts, sitting at the bench with a copy of the statute in her hand, said, Yes, Mrs. Hendrickson, this is only about failure to file. And Terry said, no, it's not. Read it. It says false, fraudulent, or frivolous, as well as failure to file. But both of them lied with the text of the thing in their hand. They both lied. And Doreen said, Your Honor, I would like this introduced as, as evidence. I'd like this to go to the jury as an exhibit. And she said no. She said no. Doreen said, Your Honor, I request that you take judicial notice. This is a statute, Your Honor. Robert said, it says the secretary, I don't know who this secretary is, and, and it was unbelievable. But that was the tenor of this trial. At the very end of trial, uh, recognizing that it was again losing this case, the government confronted Doreen in cross-examination with documents that had misrepresented and that had served, been served on you eight years earlier. That had been served on me. Yeah, eight, eight, well, they were involved in the, in the case. I told you in the, the very first thing they, they did was attack me under a, a, a charge of promoting abuse attack shelter and try and enjoy, get the book enjoyed. And that was a process that went on in courts in San Francisco and Detroit, including the very court Doreen was in, by the way, the very judge that Doreen was, uh, was, uh, that was supposedly supervising this trial. She signed one of the uh, dismissals. Uh, these four incidents that, that went on, quite elaborate, involved uh, you know, many, many filings uh, over the course of uh, nearly a year's time uh, in various courts. And the government uh, stepped up, the government attorney stepped up in front of Doreen at the, in, at, at the at cross examination within 10 minutes of the end of the trial, the evidence portion of the trial, and waved papers in her face that she had never, that she had never seen before and said, Mrs. Hendrickson, that was not actually an effort to enjoin your husband at all. It was just an audit. It was just an audit, wasn't it? And they claimed this to in front of the jury, that it was just an audit. It was an outright lie, an outright lie. Even the papers they were waving in Dorian's face, buried inside of them, say this is an effort to see if Mr. Hendrickson can be enjoined. But the jury was not given these documents. The judge decided these documents wouldn't go to the jury at all. She decided they didn't need them. And the government attorney over and over said it was just an audit, just an audit, just an audit. 
Uh, and the jury convicted this. It was an astonishing thing to see two DOJ tax uh, attorney specialists on the stand on behalf of the government do their just uttermost uh, twisted best to evade questions about what constitutes a valid affidavit. These questions were very straightforward. Mr. Metcalf, Mr. Applegate, isn't it true that for an affidavit to be a valid affidavit, it has to be sincere? I mean, isn't it true that if it's not sincere, if somebody is lying on it about their attestation of sincerity, and he said, that it's well, not a valid affidavit? If we don't know they're lying, then it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he, he said, said. I have he said a transcript. If, he said, if, he we said if we don't know they're lying, then it's okay. If it doesn't appear on the face of the document that it is a lie, then it's okay. All right, so, so clearly, um, in my mind, the DOJ, the IRS, was conducting an effort to get Cracking the Code out of print to have Peter stop publishing and selling the book. Uh, that, that was the lead up. So when we got served with the papers for the civil suit in 2006, seeing that in 2004 they weren't successful, I don't think that the um, suit was brought in good faith. It was just another effort to stop publication of the book. So when Nancy Edmonds just rubber stamped the civil suit, and um, I had no reason to believe that that was brought in good faith either. And so every, everything leading up to my trial over the 10 or 12 years that Cracking the Code has been in print, I had no reason to think that the government was ever acting in good faith. And certainly that they couldn't compel me to say something that I don't believe. They, they don't want Cracking the Code to be in print. And yet, during this whole 10 or 12 years, they continue to issue the refunds to people that are filing based on their own knowledge of what's in Cracking the Code. This is not an opinion. This is facts. That's these people getting That's the refunds. That's these refund. people. That, that could be you. Thousands of people that hundreds of thousands of people that are continuing to receive refunds. The, the fact that they are continuing to receive their refunds, the federal government, the treasury, the IRS is continuing to issue them, is an indication that what's in here is true. They will prosecute me, persecute me, whatever you want to call it, to try and suppress this book. There's no reason for it. What's in the book is true, and they continue to acknowledge it year after year, month after month, week after week. The most recent refund or victory, we like to call them victories because it's a victory for the rule of law, the most recent victory one of the readers sent to Peter last week to be posted on the website. People are proud of what they're doing, and they should be. They're trying to force the, the federal government to adhere to the law as it's written. That's right. And thank you. I, I want to uh, I want to just close here by uh, saying that our prayers are with you at this point and throughout this uh, the upcoming sentencing. That's April 9th at noon. April 9th. Second floor of the federal courthouse downtown Detroit. 2015. Yes. Um, because we know that uh, people will be watching this after that date as well. That's true. And, and yes. we'll, there'll be some updates and. Um, but uh, this information, uh, as you said, it, what happens here is going to set a precedence for what happens down the line. And it that can't could be, stand. That's it correct. It just can't. It, it is so wrong, it's illegal, it's unconstitutional, and it's got to be struck down.